<laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the fifth uh, Tech Talk series with the ASI Snowboard National Team. Um, we've been kicking off a series of Tech Talks where we're just diving into the snowboard tech fundamentals. And this is the fifth video series or the fifth Tech Talk in that series. So if you haven't seen the first four, definitely check them out. They'll be linked at the end of this video. Um, but tonight, you know, we are here as a, a ASI Snowboard National Team, and, and I'm Brian Donovan, and I just want to kind of go around the room first and let everybody introduce themselves, and then we're going to get rolling tonight. Good evening, everybody. It's Matt Larson. Hey, Amy Gann Bailey. Lindsay Stevens. Hey, everyone. Stephanie Wilkerson. How's it going, everybody? Chuck Hewitt I'm here. Right Eric Rolls here. Chris and Tony couldn't make it tonight. They're out doing something different but we'll catch them the next time. Cool, and again, uh, as we said, this is the fifth uh, series, or fifth video in this series, and, and tonight we're diving into fundamentals about controlling the relationship of the center mass to the base of support to direct pressure along the length of the snowboard. And, and that's a, a lot of words, and that's a lot of uh, really good content in this fundamental, and, and tonight we're just gonna chat as a team and really start to unpack what does that mean and, and what's that do for us in our own personal riding? How do we work with students with this fundamental? How does it affect just snowboarding as a whole? And, and, and really what can this do for us? And, and what does it help us to teach people to be better snowboarders and be more efficient on the mountain? So uh, with that, I'm just going to kind of kick it off to the team. And, and if somebody wants to, to open up the conversation, that'd be awesome. Yeah, I, uh, with this pressure along the length of the board, I, this is one of my favorite fundamentals. And I think uh, it's a lot because it's so visible when we're out snowboarding, you can see if someone's hanging out near the tail or near the nose or there's someone in the middle. And I think it's also really tangible for our riders to relate to. They, they have a sense when they're more on one leg or the other, when they've created flexion in one leg, extension in the other, their center, center of mass shifts along the board. And, uh, and so it's something they can key into as you're just, verbalizing and, and describing something to them. Uh, then when you go to the visual, again, it's another piece that's really easy to pick up. Uh, and I, I like how it, I, and maybe I'm just going to jump right to it and how this relates to other fundamentals as well as if you guys have heard us talk on the other talks, all these, they're all related, right? And, and so we get some really cool relationships with this fundamental with other fundamentals. For example, as you move along, your center of mass along the length of the board, you'll see that the pivot point is probably gonna change in the snowboard. And that's something that's like, it's just great to address right from the, the beginner, never ever snowboarder. And then also bring some really cool uh, changes to riding at, at a very high level as well. Nice Larson, All right. my, my mind goes straight to uh, yesterday. Right, so we had a couple of uh, a couple of good powder days here in Colorado over the last, uh, like the last weekend here. And I was out riding yesterday with my son who's 11. Um, and we were talking about just what you're saying there, right? It was, uh, you know, it was a powder day. So the, um, the, the pressure definitely needed to move towards the tail, right? Keep the nose up. But we were, we were talking about, uh, how we're steering, right. And kind of how we can, uh, blend a couple of those fundamentals I probably wasn't saying too much with the fundamentals with my 11 year old, but he, he likes to dork out every now and then sort of by default. Um, but it was really interesting where it's like, yeah, okay. Well, my, my pressure is definitely aft to float through this powder, right. But I don't have to let go of, of all of my steering control, right. And that, that pivot point can still, uh, be real useful, even when it's moving towards the back of the board a little bit. Chuck, I love that you use the word aft there. Um, and, you know, I, I really love the way this fundamental is written because we tend to go to the shorthand, which is, oh, we're talking about the fore or aft pressure thing. But I think it's so important that we're talking about the relationship of the center of mass to the base of support to control the pressure along the length of the board. That center of mass piece is just so important there because depending on where it is, you can make those four aft movements and it can be totally different um, depending on where you're holding your center of mass, whether your center of mass is 
moving laterally or, and, or whether it's um, staying in one sort of position and we're moving the board underneath our center of mass. A hundred percent. Yeah. We were, we were talking about really, yeah, you kind of, you know, pushing through that powder, really kind of sliding that board kind of forward into the snow instead of, you know, that slower movement of moving your center of mass is way faster to kind of push that snowboard out in front of you just a little bit and kind of ends up in that same position, you know, but uh, definitely more uh, kind of cat-like position to, to react, but moving that, that board underneath the center of mass. I think what's cool about this one and Lindsay, you kind of hit it, you know, this is fore aft pressure management, right? This has been around for a long time and we've talked about it in a bunch of different ways, but I think sometimes people think it has to be moving either your center mass towards the nose and then moving it to the tail or sliding the board underneath you. And, and I think sometimes people get stuck in this idea of it has to be the whole length of the board, like all the way to the nose to all the way to the tail. And in Chuck's example of, you know, a, a pow day, a lot of times I'm riding my, the second half of my snowboard. So like from inside my front binding to the tail only, and I'm not really trying to get super out over the nose and let that dive. I'm just really using little short bursts that really start right after my front foot maybe, and then really go to a little bit towards the tail and then just kind of reset and get back. And, and I think this is one where, you know, the elephant in the room for me, when we talk pressure management along the length is, is timing intensity and duration. You know, the, that is, this is the easiest one that we can see uh, outcomes and, and performance changes by just tweaking little TID components. And it doesn't have to be this huge gross, I'm at the nose of the snowboard and then I move to the tail and then I reset back to the nose. It can be these short little bursts and you can use parts of the snowboard instead of the whole snowboard. Uh, and I, I think this one is, it has so many applications and, and, and adjusting the TID is so important. Yeah, uh, to that Donovan um, and to what, Lindsay and Matt, you mentioned it too at the beginning, like this is one that happens at all levels and it starts by just waiting the front foot, you know, for our first turns. And something I really like have enjoyed noticing in the last couple of years is based on what uh, part, like what level of snowboarding that you're at and how long you've like, as you become an instructor, you might've never like thought about tip to tail before. And as you start to grow in your snowboarding, you kind of start to explore the range of motion and like find the extremes. And then I feel like people like start to dial that back and only go to where it's necessary. So there's kind of these different stages that I notice in people's riding of, you know, it's starting to happen and it's really happening. And then it dials back to just as much as they need and where, and it gets really fine tuned and, and it's pretty fun to watch. You can almost pick out based on how their movements and how big their movements are happening, how long or how you know, serious they've been in their training. Um, yeah, Amy, you're talking about, you know, range. And I, I think of this fundamental with um, thinking about like the sum, center of mass and where, where that range is. And we have this like maximum range. And Donovan was kind of mentioned how that, mentioning how that can change with snow conditions. But, you know, if you think about your max being here, then when we're doing some pretty casual turns, maybe that range is a little bit, more in the middle. And maybe if we're doing some more aggressive style turns, we go back to that max, but depending on snow conditions that that range can go from here to over to the side of the board, more toward the tail. And I'm you know, showing a, an example of a regular rider because I'm a regular rider. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's backwards in your camera, so. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's mirrored, so <laughs> good. Goofy example. Yeah. It's a good visual for me, the Scoopy okay. Fit. I'm glad I got <laughs> that. The range is interesting because you see people with a wide stance and sometimes they need to have a larger range to really shift the hips past the foot to really press it, um, particularly in freestyle. And people with narrow stance, they don't have to shift as much. I find that when I have my free ride board, I have a wider stance on the free ride board. And I definitely move a lot more fore and aft uh, with that particular stance. And then my kind of all mountain board is a little bit more narrow stance and I don't have to move as much to get a similar performance. And then speaking of equipment too, I'll just throw the other thing out there. I find that helps is turning the high backs. I know some of us do, some of us don't, but to adjust the high backs so they're lined up with the, the edge 
allows some pretty good freedom for and aft too. Yeah, I think that's uh that's a pretty clutch move, Rolsey, when you when you get going there is uh, you know, with students or instructors or folks that are training for for certification, especially is is showing them how you can rotate the high backs, um, you know, trying to get them a little closer to parallel to that heel side edge of the board instead of having those extreme angles right on your feet that can that can block your your ankle and your lower leg from moving um, towards the nose and tail of the board. Uh, that's a, that's a big one. And, uh, yeah, if you haven't heard about that, you could chat more about that with the trainer and get your stance set up for success uh, on the equipment bandwagon as well. I'm just real curious, um, maybe just amongst our, our crew here, um, where you guys mount, right? Cause it makes a big difference where we mount our bindings in relation to the, the nose and tail of the board, right? Obviously there's a bunch of shapes out there. Some of us like directional, boards some of us like directional twins some of us like true twins I'm just kind of curious maybe a quick little poll uh where everybody stands and and i'll start i'm i'm a true twin guy um all all the time i i like the quiver killing board um, but i like to be in the middle of the snowboard i spend a lot of time flipping back and forth between uh you know regular and switch um and i like to be right in the middle of the board, even on the deepest powder day, but that's just me and my style. I'm just kind of curious where everybody else lands. Yeah, I, I'm kind of directional right now, but I've um, in the past like to used to like to ride in the center of the board as well. Um, I, but I have made some big changes for a different reason. And, you know, the last I used to ride like a really wide stance. And, um, what that gave me was really great stability. Um, but it was kind of holding me back in terms of movement fore and aft. I didn't have as much of a range there. And so I definitely have narrowed my stance and, you know, for that reason, and for, um, getting more into magnitude of pressure, we won't, we won't go too far, <laughs> but but, you know, the two reasons there, just bringing that stance in to give me more of that range to get more performance out of my four aft movements. Nice. So, Lindsay, you're on a directional board, and are you uh, set back on that at all, or are you kind of right on where the reference is? I'm a little set back. So set back even on a directional board, right on. Ever so slightly to get my stance where I want it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Width-wise. I've been playing with some weird stuff about this because usually I've been a true twin just or as roles demonstrates <laughs> main shift. Uh, but there's a lot of technologies that companies are putting into their snowboards. And so I've uh, been putting some effort into listening more to what these boards want to tell me and looking at where they were built as far as camber profiles, which relates a lot to what it feels like to manage your center of mass along the length of the board, because your board's going to respond differently with these different cambers. And, and then they do some edge side cut stuff, you know, all that. And so uh, something that I've been doing is when I'm on a board, I haven't been on before is to look for where those reference points are, regardless of what my stance width is that I like, whatever, and just put it there so I can get an idea of what the board is, supposed to do what it's designed to do and then make adjustments from that because there's, there's a lot of a lot of neat stuff out there and i think that helps uh help helps it show yeah i can actually um mimic what matt was just saying because my other job one of my other many jobs is uh demoing women's snowboard gear and it's really interesting how you have the shape you have the taper you has is it directional is it centered on side cut where are the contact points and um it all changes and so it's like it, it just depends on the board for sure uh personally i ride a twin myself but um it's been a ton of fun to try out all these different boards like i got on a border cross board one day <laughs> and those contact points are out here <laughs> and you could really go tip to tail on that one Steph, I, I like that one of the comments you mentioned was just taper. And, you know, I'll take a step back. My everyday board is a true twin uh, 
centered stance, you know, uh, board where I'm, I'm in the middle and it's equal both ends, uh, true twin, true twin flex, true tw twin shape. Uh, but I've been uh, riding a, uh, a directional board the last couple of days with some really good snow. And uh, on the board, it actually has a, a free ride and a freestyle reference change um, where the freestyle is a little bit more centered up but the board has a ton of aggressive taper and the free ride stance is just set back one whole pattern. And what I found is it just put me in a different spot and allowed me to really get like bite and really get some cool uh, performance out of the tail of the board and really get the tail to like uh, snap underneath me and bend a little bit differently than when I was uh, forward. So just in the last two days, I just moved uh, just to see and play with it from the, the freestyle reference uh, setup to the free ride. And I just felt I was further back in the taper and I could get the, the front of the board to just kind of glide and do some cool things. But the back, the tail got really responsive and really uh, more playful, uh, you know, riding just in the, the forward stance direction. So uh, taper, I think on that board made all the difference where I was standing on it just to get it to give me a little bit more like liveliness in it. So it was really cool. I ride true twin center of the board most of the time and uh yeah even my like powder boards are still camber um and so I ride them at reference I ride outside of reference but I still keep it equal uh to where like equal each side outside of reference um yeah I don't put too much thought into it besides that <laughs> I guess my uh my bigger powder board is set back even a little bit extra um just to keep the front leg from working too hard throughout the day or the back leg working from too hard throughout the day. But nothing too crazy going on in my setup. I like the half inch setback. So setback on the never summers, it's about a half inch per insert set. So on the free ride board, it's already set back. And even the true twin, I like it set back. I have my front foot has three degrees more angle to it. So if I were to put it totally centered, the nose would actually be shorter than the tail, technically, because of the more degree. So my toes would be closer, you know, to the nose than toes to the tail of the back foot. So I like to just set it back a half inch. And that way I still get, I still get performance uh, as a twin, but it's just a, a slight variation of that. I think this is a cool conversation because I get asked this question hundreds of times a season about what boards people should ride, what boards instructors should ride as they're training for certain exams, right? They're, you know, they talk about different profile shapes. They talk about different flexes, different, uh, you know, reference or outside of reference or different things like that. But people are always kind of looking for that, that golden, uh, board. That's going to be like a great board to take, especially like a cert two or cert three exam on. And, you know, just here and around the room, there's slight differences in all of us. And it's that board that you ride every single day and just knowing the little nuances and knowing the little uh, characteristics to get it to do what you want to do is my answer all the time. You know, what board do you ride that you know exactly what it's going to do when you put little inputs in and how is it going to perform when you want it to perform and how is it going to help you get, you know, uh, different riding performance out of it is going to be the one and, and it's going to vary based on all of the different makeups that we all are different shapes and sizes, but I get this question all the time. And so I'd love to hear other people like, are you yeah. getting that question and how are you answering it? I definitely hear that question a lot, Donovan. Um, and, and I kind of, I liked Steph's answer just a little bit, right. From jumping on different boards. Uh, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's a good perspective to not be locked into that stance. It's a good starting point. If you're trying new boards, you're testing something out you know, but, but looking at the, the profile and the shape, like move your stance around a little bit, right. Particularly as we kind of rein it back in here and, and think about uh, managing pressure along the length of the board, you know, that, that directional twin or where the profile might land uh, to put your stance closer to the reference alignments. Uh, and then, and I do think it's kind of a combination in terms of picking the board that's winning for you. I like to tell people, well, find a board that, that performs how you like, but it's also close to your, your perfect stance, if you will, because every, every board has a little different hole pattern, a little different setup. You know, you might have the, the, uh, the channel on a Burton board or something like this, but um, finding that match of, of the stance that you want, that lets you move the way you want, and then getting the performance out of the board, it, it, it's kind of like a little bit of give and take. Um, so there's not one answer for everybody, but it's a, a moving target. 
I had a funny moment yesterday with, uh, I was out with one of the girls on my comp team. That's a, a racer and she's always on, she's on hard boots a lot. She's on like super board across boards, like all the good stuff. And she happened to bring out a freestyle board, which is the exact same board that I ride 95% of the time. So the 141 Burton talent scout, uh, camber, it's my quiver killer. I can take it anywhere and it rips. Um, and she was like shocked that she could actually put some carving turns down on the way down. She's like, this actually can kind of grip. I'm like, yeah, like it works really well. Um, so sometimes it's just, you know, opening up your horizon or, you know, also if you're worried about an exam or something like that, like, you know, you don't have to go too crazy, like from what you're used to or anything, you know, too different, as long as it's going to work in different scenarios on the mountain. Hey, Amy, I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned earlier and you were talking about like when students come into snowboarding and they're first starting to explore the idea of fore aft pressure management, like yeah, it's something that um, can be kind of new to some of our students that we talk to. And um, you see, you see people around the mountain and they um, you'll see people that are kind of stuck in that more aft position. Um, but it, you know, it's interesting sometimes when we start introducing being more four on the board, sometimes I feel like I see people get stuck there. And I think it's so important that word in between four aft, four and aft, and just remembering that we can move around, um, and to play with all those different areas. And as Brian mentioned earlier, you know, there's, there's this whole range in between the tip and the tail of the snowboard that we can explore on. Yeah, yeah thanks for, go, go for ahead. Chuck. <laughs> I was just gonna say, thanks for bringing us back in here. Lindsay, I know we can do maybe a whole <laughs> nother talk just about the tech, uh, yeah. but it's, uh, no, I think that's really great. I see this, uh, uh, it's important to find that, that range on your snowboard in, in terms of the four and a half movements. And we see a lot of people when they first start out you know, being stuck, like you said, more towards the tail of the snowboard. And then as we start working our way through the, the cert process, we really start to try to move forward, right? And we try to, you know, flex that front knee and ankle to get our hips and maybe our shoulders stacked over that front foot. So we can really pressure the nose of the board as we initiate the turn, right? Which is an important skill. And we really need that to, you know, power the, the, the first half of our turn, particularly as we get into the steeps and we get into the bumps. Uh, but then you see, you know, people as they are kind of in that cert two, cert three world, they get stuck there where they make this real strong movement, right? Collapsing the front ankle, front knee to initiate the turn, but they don't move back to uh, a, a more balanced or centered position or even, you know, towards the tail of the snowboard a little bit as they complete the turn, right? And we know if we're stuck in that uh, kind of position where we're really pressuring the nose of the board, it's really hard to to shape and control that pressure through the, the second half of the turn. Yeah, I think it's so important to communicate that you know, it's fore and aft. And um, when we work towards skills, I think we can harp on one skill a lot and it gets people in the mindset of like, oh, this is the right way. But really there's a time and a place for everything. And, uh, being able to explore that and trying to find out what movement is effective where is just such an important piece of this fundamental. So yeah, it's like, it's like the aft gets sort of this taboo label, you know, and that's what I'm thinking about as you guys are all talking about this, especially from that never ever snowboarder, like, Oh no, don't be on your back foot. And, but yeah, as you said, there is a time and a place for that. And, and there's a, there is that, that evolution that we see in a lot of riders as far as, all right, so now they're, you know, you're like level two ish. Now we were, they're more effective at getting forward, but then as, as many of you have said that getting aft, it gets forgotten about and how do we do that? And Chuck, you were just talking about these amazing how turns you're just having and, and like being aft is super helpful there. And, and there's some, some interesting things that uh, we see in people's riding. And, and I wanted to just uh, illustrate one of those, uh, visuals that I see when we see people, uh, let's say people moving through our, our snowboard certification program and 
and it's it's interesting it's like you'll see sometimes that those hips that have used their hips moving over to the front leg to weight that uh, move their center of mass forward and then you ask them to let to start moving aft and then all of a sudden you see the shoulders tip back and there's like this this interesting combination of compensating for your hips moving forward with moving your shoulders backwards and we end up in these weird positions with if that makes any sense this right here yeah uh but it, it's funny and we need to like come back and find where that center is and then be able to move from that effectively so Larson, I think that that's sometimes a byproduct that we spend so much time demoing, getting forward for our students that then we uh, see instructors that like change up what they think is a good position to start a turn. And I think that, you know, Amy said something a little bit ago about, you know, getting students forward and, and, and Lindsay, you, you hit on it is we get students moving forward to get them on the front foot, to get them a little bit more confident and starting to turn. But then after that, um, I think a lot of riders just, four half does butter tricks and does presses and does, you know, just moves us into like bending the snowboard in cool ways, but they don't really understand what moving aft could do or, or just the difference between being in the front of the board or being towards the tail of the board. And then all of a sudden, especially in our, our cert uh, instructors, they get to this level two world and they start hearing all oh, four aft, four aft, and they start chasing this like golden, you know, grail of four aft. But I still think that we, um, sometimes we see people that don't really understand what it can do for you. And, and I spent a lot of time working with instructors to explain, like, for me, uh, moving from the nose to the tail is just managing where I want my snowboard to grip in a turn. And so if I'm, uh, if we want to use four aft as the shorthand, you know, when I move towards the nose of the board, um, and if I'm on my toe edge and I'm also towards the nose of the board, I'm putting the most amount of pressure on that toe edge towards the nose. And then as I move my body I'll back towards the middle of the board and then eventually back towards the tail on that toe edge. I'm just moving the little part of the edge that I'm really focusing the grip on as I move across it. And then as I reset and I move over to the heel edge, I move back towards the nose and I'm, you know, on the heel edge towards the nose, not over the nose, but closer to the nose than and on the other part of the board. And then I slowly move along the heel edge. I'm just managing grip along the edge. And that's really, I really try to, explain it in that way where it's just given us the best part to grip and and we talk a lot about gripping early in the turn gripping you know with the contact points towards the nose then moving that grip through the middle of the board or the middle of the edge and then finishing the turn by gripping with the towards the tail and really just move in contact point to contact point or like we said earlier maybe it's front binding to back binding or front binding to tail where we want to but you're really managing grip along the edge and and that's the thing that i really see people move from that like chasing cert two to understanding and owning their riding at cert two and then moving towards like cert three and moving beyond that even um, is really when they start to understand that where I am really just puts grip into the edge and really helps me do what I want to do. And so that's, that's a big uh, teaching point that I work on with instructors all the time is what does this really do for us and how do we get performance out of it? And I just really talk about the word grip. Um, I think I love where you took that. Um, something that I think about with like, if the, if I'm pressuring towards the tail properly, like how do I know if I'm doing it or if I'm not? And some of those sensations that I experience are like, if maybe I'm not gripping uh, the tail of the board through the end of the turn, I might have to try to compensate with upper body rotating to kind of stop me from continuing to spin in the same direction of my turn. Um, that's one way that I might read like, oh, I should probably start pressuring my tail a little bit more and get that grip so that I don't have to fight anything. Um, yeah, trying to think of some other examples. Um, I was just thinking about when you're like, when your tail chatters out on that note of, you know, like, well, maybe there's too much pressure and maybe we've overextended, or not extended, but um, overshot that range. We've gone too far aft and that maybe is creating some chatter or, we're just hanging on to it a little too long and we've got to move our center of mass four again to start that next turn. I think, well, I think uh, we both think, we both think. <laughs> carving Carving is one that, you know, people don't really associate the fore and aft as much as like the skidded closed turns, but carving that subtle movement to get that grip as you spoke about, is super key to start start for and, and work very subtly aft towards the finish to keep that grip on the snow. I think a lot, a lot of us 
have trained the the skidded turn with a lot of at fore aft in that but that that blending of of um, controlling that pressure throughout all the phases of the turn, starting at the nose, even if you do like tilt the board using like simultaneous movements of the legs, but being able to subtly move the board under the body or the body over the board to maintain that grip for that clean carve is super key for that. And it may not be as obvious as some of the skidded versions, but to be able to shift and pick up on those cues when that board is starting to slip out so you you know shift the board or move the body to add that that grip a little bit more is key nice i like the i like this whole idea of of grip i don't know as though i've used that term to describe it which is kind of cool i think i've described it in a similar way but maybe not with grip um i think it's interesting i forget who brought it up kind of layering this concept of grip with the the timing intensity and duration uh, particularly the uh, intensity, right? Because as I, th I think about this concept, I think it was Donovan, you were talking about making sure that you're kind of pressuring the right spot along the length and we are moving in that kind of diagonal pattern as well, as you described, but pressuring that, that right spot along the length of the board to, to get the grip, to get the purchase is a big piece um, at two and three. But then I also start thinking about the intensity of that movement you know, as we look towards that level three to start uh, building towards that retraction movement, which is certainly, you know, paired in with our, um, our, our magnitude of pressure. But I think about it in that uh, managing pressure along the length of the board as well, because it's really that, you know, as we think about our kind of four middle aft, if you want through the turn, that, that, that time intensity, the duration of the aft movement is what's going to allow us to really get that longitudinal flex right. And kind of decamber that board to the point that we're going to create some rebound, right. Which will, you can feel, right. It's a real kinesthetic cue pushing back on you through the finish of the turn and in creating that rebound and using it is really a, a big piece of understanding that full cert riding to create strong retraction moves and get that board to start moving real quickly underneath your center of mass uh, through a lot of those sort of three um, riding activities we do. Yeah, Chuck, I, I see that a lot with people who have like a really intense move to finish a turn. Uh, and I see this a lot with really good riders um, who kind of own it and are potentially, you know, in that cert three realm. And they have that really strong, really intense, like uh, finish move, but mm -hmm. they struggle to have of the versatility uh, to not be super intense with that move. Yeah. And when you ask them to like soften that move and be a little bit more fluid and a little bit more uh, continuous through the turn and then like roll to the next turn without that big, you know, intense move at the end, I see a lot of people struggle with that. And so one of the things I would encourage all the people listening is make sure that as you develop your own style and you develop your own like way that you really like to do it, make sure you can still demo it other ways and you still have that in your arsenal because um, it, it, it's definitely a crutch where I see sometimes where people really rely on that really intense move to the tail and, and they struggle to back off being that intense. A hundred percent. Like, and I, I think about Lindsay's comment, um, sorry, I've just spaced it. <laughs> um, but I think about Lindsay's comment of making sure that we kind of put, put the right amount of sauce on it if you want. And I think about, um, you know, dolphin turns as an example, right. As, as like a highlighted activity we do in our, in our assessment world, right. Really it, it's kind of the most extreme or it's your range comment. I was trying to get at Lindsay. It's like, what's your range of movement, um, particularly as it pertains to, uh, managing pressure along the length. And, and we do those dolphin turns, right. We use that as a, as a training tool and as an assessment activity, not because we think you should do dolphin turns all the way down the mountain, Right. But it's something to help you find your range and understand your equipment and be comfortable moving along the entire length of the board, you know, in that in that four aft realm, obviously a couple others as well. But we'll kind of focus on that tonight. And, and, and the goal is not to do that all the time, like you say, Donovan, but it's to adjust that timing, intensity, duration and, and put the right amount of sauce on it for the right application down the mountain. All right, so I'm going to do this whole like topic change again thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, one footed riding, I just have to go there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a, a thing I hear a lot with instructors um, just telling students, 
when they're first learning how to skate or do some one foot riding around like small areas and through lift lines. I hear a lot like, all right, push that back foot against that back binding as like this, some somewhat of a rule, right? Um, and someone asked me a few years ago, they were like, I noticed you have your front foot, like, or your back foot, like right up against your front foot when you're one footing. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I do. <laughs> and I started noticing it more, but um, I noticed I actually move my foot around a lot while I'm one foot riding. And then right at the initiation of the turn, I'll, I'll bring my, my back foot right up next to my front foot on the board. And then throughout the control and finish phase, just slowly slide that back foot back against that back binding. And yeah, you know, I was just wondering if anybody else notices they, if they do that, um, I've definitely found that I manage my four aft pressure and my one foot riding that way. And yeah, I've been talking about it a bunch lately because I think it's really cool to be able to give students a tool to make them feel more stable in their one foot riding. There is a video circulating around. Maybe some of you have seen it in social media with the guy. It's like a Burton channel system, but it's one continuous channel for the length of the board. And the person can shuffle both feet to any point on that board. And it's like the epitome of this snowboard fundamental of moving your center of mass and changing where your stance is going to be to affect that pivot or how it decambers. And it, it's really impressive to watch. And so, listen, Lindsay, just listening to what you do with uh, moving your feet around, I just think of this image of that. Well, sounds like yeah. board surfing. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when we think about it is actually that you guys are using the word grip and I, you know, started thinking about, oh, I use that word as like stability. And um, that's how I like to make my students feel more stable while they only have one foot in and they're trying to get around a lift line that might have a little bit of a pitch to it. I, I have a lot that just came out between Lindsay and, and then Larson throwing that grenade. Um, I just have to say to anybody listening, make sure your screws in your bindings are tight enough that your bindings are not sliding along a channel that you may or may not have on your snowboard to try to accomplish four after pressure of any um, sort. Just, I have to, I have to throw that out. There. It's disco foot. And then what would this be called? Like electric yeah. slide? Yeah. Don't do the electric slide. The Amy, did you call it? It's like longboarding, longboard surfing. Like that's what it looked like. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they do like the uh, crossover steps and stuff yes not recommended go do yeah. it just, yeah just watch the youtube don't do it yourself correct just watch the YouTube. Uh, so but Lindsay, to speak to your point i have a personal experience that just happened so i uh had a board with like the a really slippery top sheet and i was like getting all that uh, we were getting some funky snow that was just like sitting on top of my top sheet and my foot was sliding all over the place. And I was like, all right, I'm going to throw a couple traction pads on it. And I just, without even thinking, threw them right next to my rear binding and then went out and I then didn't use them whatsoever because I don't put my foot there. Um, and so I think that like, uh, they're just decorations at this point. They're just pieces of flare that sit next to my rear binding. Um, but I think it's that beginner student, we give them that stability, right? It's training wheels when they can like feel the back binding against their foot. And they're just, they're feeling that they are like locked against something and they have stability, but I would hundred percent agree that I kind of stand on the ball of my foot with my rear foot. And it's just somewhere in the middle between my bindings and it changes. It kind of, I step around and I move it depending upon what I want to do. And I can say that, uh, Steph, in one of our previous tech talks, you challenged us to try to one foot like carve, I think, uh, where you like swing your rear leg over the toe edge and then over the heel edge. And I tried that yesterday and it is terrifying but fun um like trying to actually like get my body moving across the width of my snowboard with like my rear leg up in the air and um actually making turns and it was super unstable but it was pretty cool to figure out where i was standing on my board so yeah there were so many grenades there i tried that too it wasn't successful but <laughs> no. you know i'll try it again i well, i've never i my foot tends to stay in the same spot but now you got me thinking but i do shift the board you know, when the tail starts to slip around because you don't have the pressure on it, you don't have the foot back there. I tend to move the board underneath my body to get that grip. So I do move it fore aft throughout the turn, but I don't usually move my foot. But now you got me thinking, do I actually? So I'll throw another one out here for you guys on the topic of questionable ideas. Um, 
because I think it would be interesting to explore this from the, uh, the managing the, the four aft pressure perspective. So I used to do this uh, in a lot of kind of RMT or, or kind of people that are have level three uh, and beyond clinics, if you will. Um, but anyone can try it. And I think with the right snow conditions and uh, a, a gentle slope, it can be pretty, pretty okay. But that is uh, doing the one foot Mongo turns, right? And that's putting your, uh, so, so strapping your regular foot in uh, and then riding switch. So your, your new front foot is not strapped in. Uh, and it's really kind of interesting, uh, you know, to try to make a couple of turns uh, and see where your, where your weight or where your pressure point lands. Because when you start out, you rely pretty heavily on that, on that back foot that's strapped in, which is your normally your front foot. Um, but as you gain a little bit of comfort of it, you, you start to really kind of focus in on where that center of mass is. Obviously, obviously it's got to come towards that, that new front foot, your switch foot, which is not strapped in to get you to, uh, make those, um, make those turns start to happen. And it's really pretty interesting. Um, and, and I kind of want to think back and go try it a little bit and really see, see what I think about it under that perspective of four and a half pressure. Sounds you guys terrible. ever tried it? I'm a yeah. pro proponent, proponent of that one. Let's go do a couple hours of that when you come out for, uh, National Academy, Chuck. And backwards in the lift line, but only to okay. like see who I'm talking to and not have my back to people, but <laughs> actually having my back foot strapped in, not my front. It's set. pretty, it's pretty entertaining. I, I might've uh, been reprimanded once for uh, maybe uh, encouraging such behavior. So definitely, you know, it's, 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 uh, you got to keep it safe, right? Make sure that, uh, you know, it's not something you, you go and certainly would never teach a student, but it's a good little exercise for yourself to kind of, uh, I feel like we've been understand some of these fundamentals skating around something, but uh, we haven't talked about pumping yet, right? We have not. Or scooch leg. Or scooch leg. <laughs> I think yeah. it's skating pun because we were just kind of talking about skating. About what? Did you just make a skating pun because we were just maybe? <laughs> <laughs> See what she did there? Yeah. So you can't <laughs> say that and then not talk about pumping. So what uh, do you yeah. got? Oh me? I, uh, oh me? I was just gonna throw it out there and let everybody else talk. I, I, yeah, Amy, I was thinking the same thing. Like we've been talking a lot about the input that we put into the board to manipulate it, uh, being proactive with moving ourselves over that board. But sometimes we get energy from the snow or the terrain that we're on and we have to manage that, which falls into that category of managing our center of mass along the length of our snowboard. For instance, bump or some choppy terrain. If we are you know, going through this stuff, there's definitely a change where that pressure point is on that snowboard as we ride through that terrain. And it's, and it's more of a response than it is, uh, us just getting to do whatever we would like at that moment. We have to have a more of a two way relationship with the snow at that point. Sure. And I think that's a really like, it's a perfect blend between magnitude of pressure and for an F, but when we actively want to gain speed on our snowboard um, and we have terrain that's, you know, going up and down and is different. We can use that with a front foot, back foot push into the transition to like boost ourselves along, which is a really, really fun sensation. It's, you know, how you pump a mini ramp and skateboarding and, you know, something that, something that we do all the time and having that skill as we learned last week, as Lindsay and I were on a traverse track, like there's moments in snowboarding where we really need those skills. And, uh, and sometimes they don't come up in like our normal lessons until you're kind of in that environment. Um, but it's a pretty fun skill and a pretty important skill. I think there's a couple of things that go with that one. So first, when Larson's talking about, he, you know, he threw him bumps, uh, reference alignments are huge, right? To get this performance as we move along the length of the snowboard, if we're not uh, in a position where our body is maximizing range of motion, we can really lose performance. So if you're in bumps, you're on something steep and you're leaned way back and you're trying to like get any type of uh, like uh, four aft movement, you're not gonna be as effective if you're not just in good reference alignment. So making sure that we have, you know, parallel lines between joints of the body is huge to get this. Then Amy, I, I actually had a, a guy I was working with a couple of weeks ago who I think had some understanding of what you're talking about, but didn't understand that terrain played into it. 
you know, when it comes to pumping. And, uh, and he was really talking about if he just used fore aft, he was accelerating um, down the mountain. And, and without terrain, it wasn't this, you might feel a slight, uh, your board move in front of you for a brief second, but you're not actually uh, accelerating down the mountain unless you're using terrain to your advantage. And I think that, that what you're talking about is really key because it's it's using a roller or it's using some type of uh, change in the shape of the, the snow or the surface to get a little bit of uh, performance coming out of it. But it really relies on making sure that your TID is on point and that you're using that, that um, terrain to your advantage to get that to happen. And so I think that's a super high level concept. Uh, and I think that sometimes people might hear little buzzwords in it and think that it applies across the whole mountain, but it's really important that the terrain is, is present and you're using that terrain to get that performance. And, and it's definitely then like, think of like a BMX racer as they go through like rollers and they just are like taking off and they're using the timing to be super dialed to really blow through really varied terrain, very similar with what we can do, but it does require some terrain to help us. Yeah. And doing the opposite. I mean, look at, somebody in a half pipe that's trying to get up to the top of the wall. And if they're sometimes nerves play into it and they make our, you know, they don't let us stay strong against the transition. And so we absorb it. And then all of a sudden we lose all our speed, even though we might've taken the right line and everything else, if we're not keeping those strong legs to continue uh, that speed, then, then we're going to dump all that speed. It's like a kill bounce on a trampoline mm -hmm. or like you said, skating a mini ramp. If you like, if you get that person gets a little, they're skating a mini ramp and they're starting to get a little too high for their comfort. All they have to do is just let their legs get super soft in the transition. And all of a sudden they kill all their speed and now they're back in the flat bottom. And so the timing of that move is super key and it can be almost a two footed move, but there's slight uh, four aft to it. Yep. I think okay, on, this pump, on this pumping thing, just while we're still on this rolls. Okay. Yeah. Cause like, I was going to change the yeah. channel. Because there's that this other element that I think doesn't get enough attention is like, okay, so you pump on the down, but then to keep that momentum to absorb as you come up and not let that that face slow you down again is that other component. And so it's like pairing those movements and moving forward just at that right rate. So you uh, are where you need to be forward just as you come to the peak of that next rise. So, so it's there's a lot of components in there. And I think it's really neat to nerd out on that part. Those Red Bull border cross like courses that have been popping up off our social media for the last couple of years, but the new one just popped up this past week mm -hmm. where he's pumping and gapping and hitting all those things perfectly. Just watch that over and over and watch the body position because there are such nuanced, subtle moves that he's doing to be in the right body position, to be at the right trajectory, to match terrain. And, and there's so much cool stuff going on in those videos outside of the ridiculous course that he's, you know, gapping through, uh, it, it, there's so many cool little moves that he's using to be successful. I was just going to throw out a common pitfall with that, with in particularly like the aft movement on the heel side, you see a lot of people extending down the hill instead of, I think you used the term, Brian, you said it, it was, it was, uh, parallel like the legs were moving parallel with each other as you're shifting hips back um, into that aft position and you see a lot of people extending down the hill thinking that they're in that aft position and so which is going to push the pressure down the hill and create more chatter where to, when you use aft and create that that grip and get that board to slice across the hill that'll reduce chatter so it's like the, the um, it's just something common I see um, when people are, are trying it for the first time. And I think about, I think about, you know, rolling that pressure, you know, to the outside of the foot um, at, on either end to really get that as opposed to really rolling that pressure toe to heel in this case. I, I think that's a, a really key point roles. I, it goes back to something Amy said earlier, you know, when you're talking about um, feeling like cues when this is working, one of the cues for me in riders is if they can feel that their momentum is going out of a turn and sending them across the hill, coming out of a turn and sending across the hill. That's when I feel that they're starting to understand how the grip works and how they can really uh, come out of the bottom of a turn with momentum going 
this way as opposed to just their momentum going straight down the hill, right? Because that move you're talking about, if somebody's kind of finishing a turn and extending or they're tall, typically their momentum is going more straight down the hill than it is carrying the momentum out of the turn. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's one of the sensations that you can like uh, pay attention to is where do you, where's your momentum being flung coming out of your turn? Is it falling down the mountain straight in the fall line or is it actually coming out of the turn and carrying that momentum? And there's a ton of drills you can do to work on that. The other piece that you just hit on, I think this is the single most uh, almost overused piece of feedback I give people when they're really trying to get the timing of this is um, at the end of your turn, is your rear leg long or is it short? Right. So as they finish a turn, especially heel side that you were talking about with chatter, if you can just grab a video on your phone and show somebody, you know, frame by frame at the end of that heel turn is the rear leg long. Here's my long, or is it short up under the body? And that's going to be the difference between really feeling pressure in the tail versus extending down the hill and getting chatter. And so um, that is probably the most common thing that I really want people to understand is really to start to get towards the tail of the board at the finish of the turn, you should be starting to, to soften and shorten that rear leg. And that will help drive that performance as opposed to that big rear leg extension move. Mm -hmm. And another, yeah. another external cue I'll just throw in is if you, at the finish of the turn, if you see the top sheet of your snowboard in front of you, you're likely extending. If it stays, you know, if your back leg is staying short, it's under your body and you likely won't see the whole top sheet of your, yes. of your floor. It's just another, uh, another external cue. I heard a, I heard a great thing in a level three uh, teach one time, you know, the, the candidate at the time was talking about, you know, take, take the nose of your board and run it through the table saw, run it through the table saw with your feet. So you're, he was getting this like pushing motion and it really, it really stuck um, for me and the other candidates that were doing it too. So it was pretty cool. It's like, yeah, you're just taking your feet and you're running your, Nose ear board. We all cringed a little bit, of course, but run the nose of the board through the table saw, um, as opposed to you know pushing it forward. So, sorry, Amy. I think you were saying something. You were going to say something. Oh, I was just. I was about to say. Uh, I think this is another great um, thing to point out of why this fundamental is written as control the relationship of the center of mass to the base of support. Um, because, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about where that center of mass is, if we're simply just extending that back, back leg, there's a good chance our center of mass isn't where we want it at that moment um, to help manage that pressure. I like that. Another little cue I like to use um, to kind of help folks land in the right spot. It's kind of directed at that same feedback, right? Where Donovan, you were talking about is your back leg uh, long or short, I think is what you said. Um, but as, as people think about, you know, they have these little things where they'll say four, middle, aft, four, middle, aft. And that's kind of the story, but I like to remind people that it's actually four, middle, aft, middle, four, middle, aft, middle. It's because it's after that, right? And you've got to kind of blend that when you get to the the finish of the turn, you've got to be careful not to over, you know, overdo it because you need to get back to the nose of the board by the next turn. And so we see that kind of extension or kind of that, uh, you know, washout extension of the back leg. People are overdoing it on, you know, putting the pressure towards the tail of the snowboard. So we want to do the right amount, but we still need to come and move towards the middle to set ourselves up for the next turn. Yeah, Chuck, I, uh, I like that. And I hadn't really thought about it that way uh, because I typically like to talk about, you know, and now Jay's all the time is the old school typewriter, right? And the little, whatever the thing is, like moves and eventually it gets to the point where it like dinged a bell and then you had to like ram it back in. It's like resetting it. And I always have talked about, you know, for after me is you're slowly moving or fast moving depending on the intensity. Um, and then when you get to a certain point, you need to reset and get back, but you do need to move through the middle of the board. Like there's not this magic where you move, you teleport from the tail to the nose. You do have to actively move back across and it can happen and you can change the TID of that move as well. Yeah. It can be like a really rapid reset or it can be like a gradual reset. And it kind of goes to what Rolls was talking when he said, carve turns versus skid turns, right? 
the move of four aft doesn't change how, how we can accomplish it. Lindsay hit it. We can slide the board underneath us. We can move our center mass above it. We can kind of shorten one leg or the other and get little pulses of four aft pressure management. Um, but those still apply regardless of whether it's a skid turn or a carve turn. It's just how do we slow them down or how do we speed them up to get different levels of intensity and performance? I think that's one of the hardest things to figure out when you're trying to get more intense riding. Um, but I'm going to throw out a drill that I like to do and I do it for myself just because it's fun, but I think it's a good way to feel all the intensity and kind of work with um, TID through that turn. But I do like high speed kind of carvy garlands. I don't know if any of you have ever done that where you're like working the whole board toe, toe to heel, like on the toe edge only and then come back and then on the toe edge and if you can do it fast enough you can really feel like those subtle differences and um, start to figure out where you need to be in order to make certain things happen steph that's awesome i, I use that move like when i want to climb terrain like on a high speed carved turn but i want to like i see something cool that i want to do on the side of a trail and i use that like high speed like almost pumping move that amy was talking about to get up and, and almost climb to then make a turn and get above something and and that's a really cool move i, I would throw it out to the group because uh, we kind of did this on the last tech talk is is now what's a way that uh, we've talked about how the fundamentals are always constantly going and blended but what's a way that you can really highlight this for a student or an instructor you're working with? Like, how do you highlight um, controlling the relationship of the center mass to the base support to direct pressure along the length of snowboard? How do you highlight this fundamental so somebody can really understand how it can work for them? And it can be a day one student or it could be somebody training for level two or level three certification. You know, go around the room. How do you highlight this one? I got um, one off the top of my head. Um, just having somebody at the beginning of the turn touch the side of their front foot, uh, like they're binding wherever they're comfortable getting, getting low to getting, getting to that side of the board. And then uh, through the middle of the turn, touching both. And then by the end of the turn, only touching the, the outside of your back foot. So boot grabs for the gold. Boot grabs. Um, I like to do like a little science experiment and, you know, I could set this up for students or trainees depending on how we word it but um i like to do a set of turns where i'll challenge the riders to nose press throughout the entire turn and tell me where they felt the most stable the initiation the control or the finish and then um I'll, we'll do the opposite we'll do a tail press throughout the entire turn and talk about where was that turn the most stable was it the initiation control or finish and then from there, we can piece together, okay, where, where would you want them be for? Where would you want to be aft throughout the different phases of the turn? I like uh, approaching this fundamental from a stationary exercise of, and being that this is a relationship between the snowboard and the body, how those things work together, that just from holding still, standing still, that uh, you... Uh, first, say, try moving your center of mass along the length of your snowboard while you're very tall and compare that to being somewhere in the middle of your range of motion as far as tallest and shortest. And then again, where you're very short. So you can uh, begin to build the, that awareness in your body of, okay, well, if I'm here, how does that affect my ability to move along the length? Because depending on the scenario, whether we're a beginner snowboarder or we're very advanced, you could be anywhere in that range and need to move along the length of the board. I still jump in little drills we like to do in the, uh, in the four half pressure. Well, uh, one I like to do kind of more intermediate students to kind of, to advance Steven, um, to start to, to work through some timing intensity duration is, uh, I'll do some, uh, tail press competitions. Um, and, and I'll kind of do it in a couple different ways. And I'll say, uh, all right, who can do the longest tail press, right? In terms of, you know, pick a mellow green run, who can, you know, hold the tail press down to the tree island or the bamboo or whatever it might be. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of do the flip side. I'm like, okay, now who can do the highest tail press and get the, the nose of the board, the highest off the ground. And I kind of use that as a, as a little 
fun way to, to introduce a couple different ways that we can move towards the tail of the snowboard. Uh, and it's always kind of fun because people get a kick out of it. And then, you know, the kids usually just end up doing that for the rest of the day. <laughs> I like that, Chuck. That's fun. I like to, uh, I like to try to get um, people transitioning from when I, when I want to get them to transition from moving their body over the board and introduce moving the board under the body, I'll do it static sometimes, but I really like when you're traversing on an edge and carving across the hill and you just get them to shuffle that board for aft, get that front leg long, back leg short, bring it back, and then challenge them to try to do that throughout the turn, even the shaping of the turn, which is a bit, a bit harder, but um, it's always a good challenge to get that, that movement. I encourage them to keep their, their upper body pretty stable and, and stacked and really shifting uh, that board. Um, so you, the board ends up, it's kind of interesting. It's like, you're not moving fore and aft, right? But you end up in fore and aft from that movement. So a little nuance in that, that regard. Yeah, Rosie, that's, um, that's probably my favorite one as well. And, and what I like to do is I, what I like about it is you can use it with somebody riding the novice zone, somebody in the intermediate zone or advanced zone, and you just change terrain. You just ramp up the difficulty or the steepness of the terrain. But by making that shuffle happen on the traverses to start, what I really like to focus in on is making sure pivot doesn't happen. And then it ties back into body position, right? So yeah, you, we've all seen it where somebody's trying to make those uh, shuffles happen. And really, I see it more on the heel edge, like coming across a heel edge traverse and trying to slide the board underneath you. And if you're twisted up or you're rotated or you're not really just in a good athletic body position where you have good range of motion, there's little nuances or little pieces of the board want to pivot. And that just is immediate you know, feedback to the rider that we need to correct some body position so that they can be effective moving the board underneath them. And so um, I do the same thing. I put it in traverses. I then start to play with it in the turn. And, you know, when you get to the front of the board, let's roll into a turn and now extend that four have to move throughout the turn, you know, the three phases. Um, but that to me just teaches how do I slide the board underneath me um, without um, having pivot happen or without having a turn start or without having an edge change happen, but can I just slide it underneath me and can I manage that? And that really just helps me um, kind of unpack what it needs to be successful to have movement along the length of the snowboard with everything else being, uh, you know, taking a, a side seat at the moment. So I really like that one. So it's very, very cool. So any, I think we've hit uh, this fundamental pretty hard. And I, I think that this fundamental is there's so much in it and there's so much to uh, understand, but uh, like we've said in all these tech talks, I would highly encourage everybody listening in, um, go out and play with these, uh, ideas and go out and see how you understand it and how it works for your own writing and then start to find ways that you can communicate that out to your students right that's the whole goal of the, these uh, tech docs is how do we as instructors understand these for our own writing and then ultimately how do we use them to help our students get a little bit more efficient and a little bit basically soften the learning curve for our students so that we can give them these um, understandings and give them these nuggets uh, when they need them so that they can be successful um, and, and that's really uh, so go out and practice and play with these in your own writing, change the TID of these movements, um, pay attention to what kind of sensations you get and what kind of grip you get and what it does to you. Go out and ride one footed and, and try to see if you keep your foot in one position or if you move it around or where the ideal position is for you. Um, but go out and play with this in your own riding and then start to break it down and, and understand what it's doing for you and pay attention to it. And then, you know, come back and, and, and come back into this content and see where you calibrate and where you line up with some of the stuff that you heard us talk about tonight. And so um, that's the whole point of these. Again, this is the fifth in a series of six uh, tech talks that we're doing about the fundamentals. And then we are kind of strategizing having a seventh um, live Q and a session where uh, we're going to invite members uh, to be part of it and to uh, talk through some of the things that have happened on these, on these ultimately these six calls with the team and really just make it a Q&A of your experiences and how they've uh, affirmed or denied or, or just given you a little bit more insight into how they can work for you or work for your students. And so that's really where we're at. So if you haven't checked out the first four, you know, I'm gonna use the shorthand for them, but we did one on 
tilt. We did one on pivot, uh, twist, and pressure across the width of the snowboard. And again, that's that's actually doing a disservice to the fundamentals by using the shorthand. Um, but just for for time's sake, you know, those we have done four, and this is the fifth one, and there will be a sixth one coming out. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to Stephanie. Um, you've been hanging out in Montana this week a little bit, and I just think it's a good opportunity for you to brag about the mountain that you got to explore this week, and maybe do a a pitch for rider rally coming up. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, I don't know. Matt's been wearing me out, uh, but we <laughs> came up here, been cranking some trees. Um, steeps have been riding great. There's tons of moguls to play on. And if you're into freestyle, I was blown away by how good the Big Sky Park is. Uh, super fun. Plus, on top of it, it's just beautiful out here. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a ton of fun. There's, there's all sorts of things to do. There's endless terrain, Just lots of exploring. Yeah. So uh, that couldn't have been any more of a, uh, an enticing care to dangle out there because big sky um, national Academy and rider rally are coming up in April. There are still spots available as though I don't think a ton of spots available for both, but there are still spots available for both. So if you are even considering it, um, Steph is a testament of how fun the mountain is. Uh, Matt uh, has chosen to live there and make that his home. And this whole team um, is making efforts for all of us to be there so that we can ride with all of you. So uh, check it out. Um, and yeah, we'll see you there. Peace, everybody.